Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're glad to have you here for the first of our two webinars that we have planned. Today's topic will be on the design and construction of uh, obstructions and reinforced fill, and will be presented by our technical services specialist, Keith Miller. Keith has been with us for three years now and has over 16 years of experience in the segmental retaining wall industry. Uh, we need to go over a few administrative items before we get to Keith. Um, this webinar defaults to a delayed broadcast. If you prefer a live feed, there is an option to check the live feed option. Otherwise, you'll receive about a 15 to 20 second delay in uh, the feed of the webinar. Secondly, the communication may only be done via the chat option. You should have options on the right side of your windows. Uh, you can utilize those. I'll be moderating the chat. We'll try to answer questions as they come in. Um, and at the end of the seminar, we'll likely do a few of the common questions and just talk about them a little bit live. Um, and finally, uh, as many, many of you likely will be logging in via the anonymous option uh, at the end of the Power, PowerPoint presentation, we have a process for you to uh, fill out and receive your uh, CEU PDH credit if it applies for you. And without further ado, we have Keith Miller here to uh, go through the webinar. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Dan. I want to welcome everyone to our webinar this afternoon. As Dan said, we're going to talk about obstructions within the reinforced fill zone of a segmental retaining wall. Uh, we talk about this, we skirt around this. Uh, we ask the question uh, through a question and answer thing, and uh, this was a major topic that came up and we decided to do a, a webinar regarding um, obstructions in within the reinforced fill. Uh, obstructions uh, can take many forms. I'm going to concentrate on the area in the reinforced zone. Um, as most of you know, segmental retaining walls are probably the leading uh, site development option when it comes to retaining walls. Uh, they are flexible structures, they're soil reinforced structures, they're gravity walls, uh, whatever form they may take, a segmental retaining wall typically is the go-to option when it comes to uh, designing a site and doing great changes on a site, whether they're cut or fill walls. Uh, a typical example here, uh, we have a retaining wall uh, running around the property. Uh, in this case, uh, we have storm sewer, uh, coming in behind the wall uh, in multiple locations. Uh, we've got buildings on the site uh, of various different types and forms. Uh, when you're a site developer, uh, you want to know, you want to maximize your site and you want to know where things are. When you're a wall designer, you want to know where things are, what's going to be involved in the wall. One of the problems that we have uh, with our walls is we are typically the first on the site. It's a great, uh, thing to have. We are one of the first, uh, you have mass grading on the site and you put your retaining walls to get your site up to grade. Problem with, that you have with that is, is you leave the wall in a unfinished state for a substantial, could be a substantial duration of the, of the job site construction. Uh, we want to take precaution and precaution people on what's going on. So you might have the wall installer complete the wall way before you put in a lot of other things that go on with the wall. So we want to take those things into consideration and hopefully I'm able to point some of those out today. Here's a typical uh, retaining wall. We've got a retaining wall at the front. This one ends up having a fence behind it, has a guide rail behind it, curb and gutter, storm sewer and pavement. Basically in this one slide, we almost hit everything I'm going to talk about today. Um, when it comes to a site developer and a site layout, you want to maximize your space and have everything included as best as possible. And some of that, some of those things happen right in the reinforced zone behind the retaining wall. And as a designer, we need to take that into account. And as construction people, we also need to take that into account. So we make sure that things are staged properly and done at the proper period uh, during the wall construction. For today's uh, topic, I'm going to go through uh, these items and I'm going to start out with a basic overview of reinforced wall design. Uh, we have a wide variety of people uh, involved in the seminar today. 
uh, which is great to see. I love to see all the different people and I know uh, quite a few names that were on the list that we saw earlier. So it's going to be good to talk to those people. It's a little different for me when when I'm given a presentation, uh, not being able to see people and all that, but uh, we'll get through all that today. So we're going to talk a little bit about soils, the grid design envelope. We're going to talk about vertical obstructions and horizontal obstructions. Uh, when I was putting the presentation together, I was deciding on how to how to show these off. And what I ended up deciding on is we're going to talk about large diameter obstructions and small diameter obstructions in a vertical sense. And then we'll get into horizontal obstructions, which are going to be like your uh, horizontal storm sewer lines that run parallel to the back of the wall. This could be storm sewer water lines, wiring, and then we'll spend a little bit more time on detention infiltration systems because this is uh, becoming more and more common uh, that we see on, on uh, construction sites and uh, site development. Uh, we'll get into some concrete structures behind the walls. We'll talk about our typical barriers, fence posts, guide rail posts, get into plantings, and then we'll uh, close out with our uh, closing comments and uh, contact information at the end. We are building soil reinforced structures, so we want to know what the soils are. We want to know what type of soil is on the site, what type of soil we're going to use for reinforced backfill, uh, what type is going to be retained. We still want to know what the soil is. This is a reinforced soil structure. We are including items into the reinforced soil map that we're going to talk about. They could be uh, catch basins, storm sewers, whatever it is behind there. So we're including that into the reinforced soil zone. Uh, here's a typical preferred gradations. Uh, these are standard, pretty much standard. Uh, what I like to point out here, uh, this, this, the standard sieve analysis, uh, zero to 35 passing the num number 200 sieve with a PI less than 15 for walls under 10 feet tall. If you get over 10 feet tall, we're going to typically go to a PI less than six. And if you get into the taller walls over 20 feet high, we're going to uh, reduce our number 200 passing to 15%. These are pretty much standards and standard gradations that the industry has moved to in the reinforced zone, uh, reinforced grid zone behind the wall. Uh, it does vary some in, in various parts of the country. Uh, so we want to uh, take that, but uh, again, soils are a major thing. We need to know, know what our soil types are on the site. We need a soil analysis for that, and we need it done in the area of the retaining wall. With that soils information, we want to know the design properties uh, for that soil, most u moist unit weight, effective shear strength of the soil, if there's any cohesion in that retained and foundation soil, and then we want to know what the minimum compaction density is for uh, or is going to be. And that's all provided by the geotechnical engineer. Once we've determined our soils for the site, you know, we also got to look at what type of wall facing we're going to be using. There's a whole variety of different segmental retaining wall products out on the market uh, from our compact three unit with a hewn stone face pin system, our standard unit, uh, our stone gate system. Um, our Regal Stone Pro Lip system and our Broadstone uh, Lug system. Um, we have a variety of products, and you got to look at the facing type uh, on your retaining wall uh, to make sure it's going to fit into the application that you're presenting. Uh, setback in the wall uh, facing um, may may have an advantage or disadvantage depending on where structures are in behind the wall. So those are things that we got to look at. Uh, they're not all interchangeable all the time. We also have to know what the connection capacity is of each individual system that we're choosing for this. So we want to know what our facing is. Uh, and in some cases, some facings might not work with some of the connection devices that I'm, uh, that I'm going to show later on in the slide presentation. So we want to know what our facing is. And then we want to know what our design envelope is. Today, we're going to be talking about typically what's in the reinforced zone behind the retaining wall. Maybe a little bit into the retained zone back here. I'm not going to get into too much about the foundation other than uh, we want to make sure we have a solid foundation to build our retaining wall. Uh, that's the envelope we're going to be talking about today. Uh, to determine 
what this envelope size is going to be, we have to know what's going on at the top of the wall. Is there a slope at the top of the wall? Is it level backfill? Is there some type of surcharge? Uh, all these loading conditions are going to affect what the grid length is, along with what our soil conditions are uh, behind the wall, in the reinforced zone, in the foundation soil. We also want to know what is going on in front of the wall. Is it a level situation or is there a slope in front of the wall? If it's level, your embedment depth changes. If it's if it slopes, your embedment is different. Uh, in all cases, though, our typical leveling pad is going to be a 24 inch wide leveling pad, six inches tall. And this is going to be a standard road base type gravel material uh, to set your leveling pad on. Again, our systems are flexible, they're soil structures, so we're generating everything based on that. Uh, based on our wall height, our exposed wall height, we're going to figure out our embedment depth. Just as a refresher, our embedment depth minimums are 10% the wall height or one block, depending on how tall your wall is going to be. If I have a slope in front of the wall, we're going to increase that embedment depth uh, based on what the slope is in front of the wall. Once we've determined uh, what our embedment is going to be down here, we're going to have our overall wall height. And based on standard practice minimums, we're going to have a reinforcement length based on an overall wall height from top of cap to top of leveling pad of 60 to 70 percent uh, the wall height. So a 10 foot high wall, your grid lengths are going to be six to seven feet long. Uh, depending on what that surcharge condition is, if it's level uh, with no load on it, that's probably going to be your minimum grid length. If we have a slope on there and it's a larger slope, that grid length is going to get longer. It might be 100% the wall height. Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at from face of wall to end of reinforcement uh, for our, our talk today. Typically, what we're also going to see for a 12 inch deep block unit that our grid spacings will be no more than two feet apart. That our block spacing at the top of the wall and at the bottom of the wall are typically going to be about two block spacing. This may vary a little bit at the top of the wall and a little bit at the bottom of the wall because of the way the wall steps up as it goes along the length of the wall. Uh, but that's basic envelope of our design for a segmental retaining wall. The other thing that we're going to look at is that our reinforcement lengths are continuous, 100% continuous from the front face of the wall to the end of the reinforcement. With polyester geogrids, what we want to make sure is that those grids are 100%. There's no way to splice the polyester geogrids together and that our grid coverage is going to be 100%. Basically that we don't overlap the grids, but we have them set side by side. So down the length of the wall, we have 100% coverage uh, of our reinforcement. Very typical again. I found this in NCMA and it's also a, a good help too. Uh, what is the zone of influence or what is the design envelope of our retaining wall? Uh, typically, we used to always say that the, the zone of influence or what we want to look at is anything within twice the height of the wall. So you'd take the height of the wall from top of leveling pad to top of cap, take twice that. Uh, so if it's a 10 foot high wall that we have here, you would have a, anything that's in 20 feet. We want to know what's going on as a designer. Uh, we also add to that that if we have a sloping condition, we take the height external, which is at the back of the reinforcement up to the where you crest out of the slope plus the length of the grid. So whichever larger of the two, so twice the height or H external plus L as your design envelope. Now, basically that is stating what I want to look at and be aware of in and around the retaining wall and see how that influences the design as a designer. Our discussion today is going to limit ourselves to what's included into the grid zone uh, in either case or uh, what's in behind, um, right behind the grid zone. Uh, we'll talk about that also. Back when I started designing retaining walls, I don't remember how long ago Dan said that was, but uh, it was it was quite a while ago. You know, basically we'd a contractor would say, I need an estimate, and I'd say, send me the soils report, send me a grading plan. I want to know where the walls are, what the elevations are around the walls, and I want to see what kind of loads they have on the walls. Nowadays, 
because we've become so prevalent in site development applications, I also want to see what the utility plan is. I want to see where the storm sewers are. Is there any inclusions behind the retaining wall? All where the catch basins are, all of this kind of stuff that's going on uh, behind the retaining wall or even in front of the retaining wall in some cases. We also want to see what the landscape plan looks like. What are they planting in behind the retaining? We've got a retaining wall face out here. Now we're putting some plantings in here. You know, and now I got to become an arborist or figure out what all the Greek names are for plants. And, and Google helps me out on that, figure out you know, what size of caliper these are, what size of root balls they are, uh, because they should be included into the design of the retaining wall. And lastly, we're also going to want to know what the lighting and electrical things are uh, going on behind the retaining wall. In this plan here, we can see there's light standards that are proposed right behind the retaining wall. In addition to that, we want to know where the electrical is going uh, for that lighting and the electrical that's going uh, that's going into a building or or whatever structure is that's behind it. See if that's going to be in the influence area behind the retaining wall. Um, just all little things, and it becomes a construction issue there. Here's a typical um, screen capture that I grabbed from a, a project uh, off of Google Maps. Uh, Google is an amazing thing of what you can do and, and find out about projects. Uh, we have a retaining wall out front here. Uh, in this application, this retaining wall does exceed uh, 30 feet in height right in this location here. We have a catch basin here, catch basin here, one back here in the parking lot. Based on this screen capture image, to me it looks like all of the water they have funneling right to this catch basin uh, that's picking up whatever it is that's staining the asphalt here and putting it right into this catch basin. I would strongly encourage any site developer out there to move any catch basin that you have out of the reinforced zone behind the wall into the middle section of the of your parking lots, whatever it is, it makes it much easier. One of the biggest um, obstacles that we have or one of the things that'll make uh, your life miserable with retaining walls is adding water to the back of the wall. Water can do a lot of damage to any structure and by putting catch basins uh, right behind the wall, not that we can't include them in the design, we just take a little added risk to that. So we want to be careful where we place those. Vertical obstructions, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Vertical and horizontal obstructions behind the retaining wall. Typical retaining wall face, we have a vertical obstruction being placed in. Part of the uh, process here is knowing where that uh, vertical obstruction is going to be, placing it during the wall construction so we minimize uh, any damage to the retaining wall and into the reinforcement of, of, the, of the structure that we're building. So we wanna have construction sequencing. Uh, the wall guys might not be the same guys that are putting in vertical structures. So we wanna have construction coordination going on as we put those in. Here's a nice example of a horizontal and vertical structure. You got a vertical manhole here with a nice concrete head wall uh, preformed for the contractor to come in, um, abut the wall right to the, uh, face of the structure here and, and build up around the wall. And we'll discuss this later on. But you can see here, we have a storm sewer contractor that's uh, putting in the piping and then a wall contractor that'll come in and put in the retaining wall. Uh, in this application, I like to see here, hey, we're using a granular backfill material uh, back in this area. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, increasing your drainage area uh, use of better materials in certain situations in and around these storm sewers. Here's a nice example where we got a lot of things going on uh, behind the retaining wall. We got horizontal uh, inclusions in behind the wall uh, down the center line. We got a wall on both sides here. This is an application where uh, we're crossing a low area. This uh, There's water here, so this might also have a culvert running underneath here. I'm not sure in this application. Uh, but here again, we need to stage our construction so that our uh, everything gets put in at the proper time. All your re all your backfill materials compacted properly. Everything's done uh, as the wall is being constructed. 
I'd like to start out with this statement here. Uh, here's a uh, retaining wall. We got a pier in behind the retaining wall. And this kind of is, is what we're gonna talk about. Design the surrounding reinforcement layers, layers to carry the additional loads, which would have been carried by the severed reinforcement. Place the structural frame around the obstruction, which is case, capable of transferring loads from the reinforcements on one side of the obstruction to reinforcements on the other side of the obstruction. So you can see here, this obstruction is fairly close to the back of the retaining wall. It's gonna penetrate through the geogrid layers. So we're gonna uh, place uh, some type of construction uh, apparatus around that structure to handle the load of the reinforcement. Here's another example of uh, a building being placed right behind the, uh, the retaining wall facing in the reinforced zone. This building is setting on a series of piles that carry the load of the building and don't transfer any load down into the retaining wall structure. If there is a transfer of load in here, we gotta account for that. The wall designer has to account for that. And the wall designer has to be made aware of what those design loads are gonna be uh, when he's doing his wall design calculations. Well, we'll get into some examples here. And this is our vertical obstruction, large, di large diameter and continuous through the reinforced fill area of the retaining wall. Continuous meaning it starts at the wall and extends down past the, the, the leveling pad all the way through the reinforced zone. Uh, I, I broke this up into small diameter and large diameter. So these are gonna be uh, structures that are two feet or larger. Typically, we're gonna have a maximum diameter of your structure at five feet or 60 inches as a maximum diameter. Uh, when we use a construction frame to transfer the load of the reinforcement around the structure and back into the reinforcement on the other side. This reinforcement frame typically is going to be like a four inch schedule 40 galvanized pipe right here. You're going to use some uh, a threaded rod, a continuous uh, threaded bar to tie the front frame together with the back uh, frame and then you're gonna use a nut adjuster to uh, get your tension into, the, into the, the grid as it passes around the structure. Uh, we typically limit it to five foot maximum diameter uh, because what you end up doing as these bars get longer and they do need to extend past this that you could um, inf induce a bendy moment into the bar itself. So the designer of the wall has to take a look at sizing of the, of the uh, of the schedule 40 pipe here typical is four i see three on uh three inch on some applications we want to have a minimum distance from the back of the wall or from the face of the wall back to the structure typically in these applications we're having a three foot minimum distance here uh, on the grids on the back side here we want to overlap uh, the grids and tie it back there is no way to actually uh, sew these or weave these together so we rely on an overlap and we in place that at, at, at a five foot overlap. Uh, so this is very typical of the way we would handle a continuously vertical structure. Um, and then at the face of the wall, um, we're going to take our grid, bring it back to our, our pipe and then bring it back to the front of the wall. So we're going to stage this up as the contractor builds, builds a wall and we're going to wrap these. Uh, every time we get into one of these type of structures and one of these type of designs are unique to each other uh, because we have to know what the wall height is of the structure, of a retaining wall structure to de determine what our loading is down at the bottom, what our loading is at the top so we can determine our reinforcement spacing on there and apply uh, what's missing here and the loads to our design. Um, most or pretty much all of, a, of the design software programs that are out there do not include the ability to analyze any type of interruption or uh, this type of thing into the design software. So we have to do that uh, on our own uh, and hand calc that out and apply those loads as required uh, to figure out what our design is gonna be. So uh, this is typically used again when our spacing is uh, three foot or greater. 
Um, I don't like to use this if I get any less uh, with these large diameter uh, because we, we also need to do is have a working area for the contractors to be able to adequately put all this in, adequately get their compaction done uh, as they're building up this structure. Large diameter uh, vertical obstructions where the obstruction doesn't go through the entire reinforced zone, we can do some other things. We're gonna have reinforcement that extends underneath this structure. Again, we have, have to have construction considerations to place this at the right elevation. So we get our wall contractor to build up our wall, uh, place the structure, and then what we can look at doing is placing uh, skewing grids around the side of the structure. Depending on the structure size, again, here we're showing a five foot diameter, but we're gonna have a maximum skew of, of 15 degrees max here. Uh, what we're also gonna encourage people to do is increase the drainage zone to a one-to-one -one slope from the midpoint of the pipe to the backfill or the, re, or the drainage zone behind the retaining wall. So we'll increase this. Uh, another thing I always like to say is anytime there's a structure involved, depending on your reinforced soil type, don't be scared to increase or go to a better reinforced backfill material uh, behind the retaining wall. Uh, the better structural material you're gonna have, the better factor of safeties you're gonna have, the better constructability you're gonna have all around. So don't be scared to do that. Uh, in looking at the face of the wall, basically we're gonna have these skewed layers on alternate layers from our primary layers. So we're gonna have our primary layer here uh, that'll go along the side of the structure. And then we'll have our alternating layers that go at a skew to the structure on alternate coursing from that. So as a contractor builds that up, uh, they have to pay attention to where those alternate layers go. If we get into an obstruction, a larger obstruction um, that is a little bit closer than three feet, and we just don't have the room uh, to, to do this, and the structure diameter is small enough uh, that we're able to span in uh, the back of the retaining wall. Uh, with an angle. So what we're going to do is place a like a four by four by quarter angle along the back side of the facing to reinforce the facing through this area where you won't have any reinforcement. So you're going to spread the load out past there. Uh, you're going to connect uh, the angle through the block with a uh, anchor bolt of some type. And so previously when I was talking about block types, this could be determining what your block type is. Can you do this type of thing with some type of structure behind it? The other thing you need to consider is what is our setback here? If I'm having a block that's near vertical, it might not be such a big deal. But if I have a block with a setback in it, I might run into this area getting too close for a guy to physically work in there uh, and I just don't have the room. So I got to watch what the setback is in there. Um, behind the wall or behind the structure, we're going to have a wrap uh, to make the, the grid feel like it's more continuous to really strengthen this area up in here. And uh, basically all our load is behind here is the um, drainage stone uh, that's between the structure and the back face of the wall. Uh, you also might want to consider increasing our drainage zone out here at a one-to-one -one uh, to the end of the reinforcement angle. Uh, so that's what we can do for uh, distances less than three feet. Here's some typical examples from the job site where the guys are constructing uh, our construction frame. We have our grid coming back. They're going to be wrapping around this. They're getting their back pipe in so they can connect up to the reinforcement on the back side. You can see a full length of reinforcement in here. So we're basically transferring the load around that structure. Um, out on the job site. Another example here, I like this example. Uh, we have our grid coming back. We're going to wrap it around the pipe. We're going to, we have a tail on here to bring it back to the face of the wall. We have our grid on the back side coming around, wrapping it around so we have enough embedment uh, past uh, the, the horizontal pipe. They've included uh, the one to one off of here for a larger amount of drainage aggregate in between the, the structure and and the front facing. I'm not sure what happened in this situation compared to this pile here, but uh, 
we, we can make it work uh, with the construction frame around here. We get into smaller diameter pipes. What we want to take a look at uh, two foot and less is it, these are a little bit simpler uh, to take into account. Typically, these are you know, light poles. They might be signage bases. Um, uh, they, oh, they could be piers of some kind. Uh, we want to know where, again, where they're placed. Uh, if there's any lateral load um, placed by this structure here uh, onto the back of the retaining wall. Uh, basically, we're going to use the same skewed technology that, that we talked about earlier, uh, where we skew the grid around this, uh, the structure that's here. In this case, I'm showing a light pole that's two foot in diameter. We're also going to increase the drainage zone uh, around that structure to the back face of the wall. We're going to have our primary layers and then we're going to have our secondary layers here. Uh, typically, these are going to be three to six feet wide. Uh, grid width uh, on a job site, uh, grids vary typically from six foot rolls to 12 foot rolls. A uh, contractor might want to take into consideration uh, if you're doing some of this, uh, what size rolls that they're going to order for those applications. Um, if we get into a, another way to do this is, uh, I'm, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it, we're going to split the geogrid from the back of the wall around the obstruction and back again. Again, holding our 15 degree maximum split here, two foot minimum here. Uh, between the obstruction and the back of the uh, back of the retaining wall. These can be kind of difficult if it's a true vertical, uh, depending on what the height is and how it's placed in there is to actually split these apart and actually go around the structure. The nice thing here is that we keep the the main reinforcement, which is from the front face of the wall back, um, non-cut. We, we, it's continuous from around the structure. So we don't have uh, just a cut opening in, in the grid here. So um, that's another alternative that we can take a look at. Um, a lot of people don't really consider, you know, you get into small obstructions and you think, well, it's just a light pole. It, it shouldn't cause too much uh, issue with my retaining wall design. Well, you can see here, I got a light pole structure right behind the wall. This is a tiered structure. There's probably geogrid in here, and this has got a pretty significant light pole base at the bottom of it. A taller wall, we got a light post base. I was working recently on a, on a project uh, just before this, and we found out later after you know, we did our estimate, uh, plans kept coming out. We found out, hey, we got light poles behind here, and here's what we're gonna use. Well, the light pole they're using has got a 12 by 12 base, and it's embedded nine feet into the ground. And then we have our electrical connection uh, just below the ground layer. Um, nine feet, the wall was 10 feet high. So we got to make sure that the grid or the wall and the light pole are almost going up at the same time, or we take into some uh, consideration maybe of sleeving these with some type of sauna tube so the light uh, installer can put the lights in something that's already built into the backfill of the soil. So we want to know what we're doing and consider that right up front. Signs, another thing that the wall the designer doesn't see very often is signage. What is the signage going to look like at, at this facility? What is the foundation for that signage going to look like? Another thing that I see in here, electrical boxes. Okay, we got electrical box. That means there's power coming to this. That means there's reinforced uh, or electrical lines probably running in the reinforced zone. How is that all going to be handled? Let's be aware of that. Uh, I like this slide. We got a signpost, we got electrical, and we got some type of uh, pedestrian guide rail uh, or handrail up at the top. All things to consider. Once we go from vertical structures, now we get into horizontal structure. Horizontal structures can be easier to deal with because they're typically smaller, but they're harder to deal with because they run typically the entire length of the retaining wall or for a substantial amount of the retaining wall, parallel with the back of the facing of the wall, where a vertical structure is, is discrete. It's in a small area that we can handle in discrete intervals as we work down the wall. Anytime we get into a horizontal 
obstruction in through the retaining behind the retaining wall. We definitely know want, want to know what the size of that structure is. We are allowed to skew the grid a little bit, uh, 15 degree max again, uh, above and below. And in some cases, we might consider putting more layers of geogrid in between these layers to, to just add a little bit more strength to the retaining wall. One thing I hate about having horizontal obstructions in walls is how they're, they're placed in here. If I have to remove this structure because the pipe leaks or whatever happens to it or something changes, when I go to excavate, say this is a one to one here, I'm going to interrupt all the reinforcement layers that are in behind my retaining wall. So to excavate this pipe, I basically have to take down the, my retaining wall to the last layer of reinforcement that I've been uh, I've damaged during the excavation process, rebuild my wall so I can put continuous layers of geogrid back in that reinforced zone. So if we can, let's pay attention to move these out of the reinforced zone as best as possible. We also want to know what the diameter is of this so we we'll see how it coordinates with the elevation of the geogrid uh, that's going to be in this area. Remember I said the max spacing on this is two feet so pipes that are two feet or less could possibly pass between layers of geogrid pipes that are greater than two feet will probably have to have some type of skew uh, in and around uh, the pipe other horizontal members uh, is pipes coming out through the front face of the retaining wall when it comes out through the front face of the retaining wall we want to know what elevation this pipe is coming out through the front of the wall. Is it below the below the leveling pad? Is it in the leveling pad? Is it up on the wall? We want to know what elevation that is. I typically like to prefer every wall penetration have a concrete head wall on it. Uh, this is not always the case, but I think it looks aesthetically more pleasing and it's easier for the contractor to install because now the wall contractor has a vertical joint that he can abut the blocks to. So we can go with a full unit, half unit, full unit type sequence as he's constructing around this. And then that as we make this head wall, we want to make the head wall width um, in increments of the block length. So we have the right proper spacing here so we can keep our bond pattern going as we build the retaining wall. Uh, what else we might want to do here is add some kind of control joint, which is basically taking a saw curve and cutting the block at the face in half. So if we have settlement on either side of the structure here, that we already have a predetermined spot where the block is going to crack, and that'll uh, translate up vertically from the edge of the concrete structure. Uh, we're going to do some type of lintel on the bottom and on the top of the concrete collar. And also, if the if the pipe is uh, flowing a, a fair amount of water, we want to have some type of scour protection so we just don't erode the base of the wall using fabric, riprap, or uh, whatever type of scour protection you want to have at the front face of the wall. Here's a couple typical examples. Here's an example of a nice concrete head wall. Uh, the spacing is right, or the width of the structure is right. Uh, we got half block, full block. Uh, we have a control joint as it comes up through the face of the wall. Uh, here's an example, and this is from my earlier slide. Here's that structure that's in behind the wall. In this case, this structure happens to be at the end of the reinforcement, but the pipe came horizontally through the front of the wall. Uh, here's where we just grouted in uh, around that pipe. Uh, you can see in here, these are typically, why I say they're typically more difficult to do, uh, because elevation, uh, our block changes eight inches in height or six inches, depending on your block height. Um, and our pipe diameter might always not be the same uh, to match those height elevations. So uh, as our pipe as our pipe is coming through here, the contractor had to put a little lip under here and he actually had to cut part of the block up here to make this work right for him. Here's an example of a project that was uh, completed quite a few years ago. This kind of dates itself based on, uh, on the pickup that's setting back here. Um, but uh, 
Here's a structure of setting in behind the retaining wall that, with a horizontal pipe that runs over to another structure behind the retaining wall. Uh, contractors put in his block. Uh, he's building this wall up as he as he goes here and uh, puts his geogrid and everything. Quite a few late years later, they have a blowout in the wall. Um, can't figure out what's going on. Uh, have an engineer go out and take a look at it. What they end up finding out is that there's geogrid reinforcement throughout the length of the wall, but no reinforcement in this area that the contractor didn't place in as he was putting in the retaining wall uh, structure. At, at a certain point in time, water was flowing over the parking lot, coming to these catch basins. Catch basins would be overloaded and the water was actually going over the top of the wall and eventually had enough water going over the top of the wall that it took the top of the wall out. So now they'll have to take this back out, replace everything, build the wall back together. One thing, I really don't like this slide, but it's the only slide I could find that really shows what I want to talk about here. I have no idea what's going on with this retaining wall based on its height over here. I don't see any geogrid in here, but here's a situation where we build a vertical structure manhole in behind uh, the retaining wall. They actually took construction blanket, covered up the manhole to keep water from flowing in here, which meant keep the silt from flowing into the structure, which would flow into the detention basin over here. What I find typically happening is if we have a structure in behind the wall, the contractor starts pre-grading his site to go to this structure. What is he basically doing? He's directing all the water to come back to this structure. If we don't have a place to put that water and let it go out, the water is going to find its own place to go and it's going to try to go right through the retaining wall since the wall is free draining and allows the water to go right through the face of it. So we got to watch that. Um, anytime you're building the retaining walls, make sure that the, that the drainage is positive away from the wall structure, which is all the way back here in most cases, um, that we don't have water being directed to the back face of the retaining wall. Here's an interesting picture that I found, and this is talking about construction sequencing, making sure that everybody's on the same page of what's going on. I looked, well, this is an interesting way to bring your electrical lines to this uh, uh, structure here. They must have some type of pump in here, but they got electrical lines running through here. Then I'm, then I'm looking at this and I notice, what's this retaining wall block doing set in here? Well, what I think they did is they, built the wall, realized that we need to have these electrical lines run in here, came in here and broke the block out of the front face here, and then snaked up uh, the lines in here uh, to get their electrical lines in post wall construction. Let's get things sequenced right so we know when things are being put in. I just got this slide in not too long ago, and this is, I love this slide. This is project coordination at its best. We got our retaining wall guy, he's building our wall up. He's got his reinforcement in here. And lo and behold, we decide we need to put our electrical lines in uh, so we can run our electricity from here to the buildings back behind here. So let's bring the electrical contractor in and start digging our electrical lines because we need to have them at a certain elevation. So let's dig in here and let's cut the grid uh, right through the grid so we get to the proper elevation and then move ourselves down the entire length of the of the retaining wall. Well, folks, what did we just do? We cut the reinforcement, so now we're going to have to dig all of this back out. We're going to have to tear down the wall so we can replace the geogrid, put the geogrid reinforcement back in, hopefully put the electrical lines and the service lines that you want to put in during that time that we're deconstructing and reconstructing the wall. So let's get our construction coordination uh, going on. I showed this slide earlier. Uh, this is our stormwater detention. Uh, system. Here's our retaining wall at the front. Here's our retaining wall. Here's our storm sewer lines. We have a detention system shown in behind the wall. Uh, we have a line that runs out uh, for the outlet of the structure uh, out, out in front of the retaining wall. And they gave us, nicely gave us, a typical section uh, through this structure. This is an interesting project very typical of what we see nowadays a lot of sites have some type of stormwater detention system 
I'm going to go back to the previous slide. We also saw some type of railing or guardrail uh, in behind the retaining wall, which they neglected to show on our section uh, back in here. Uh, there's an existing retaining wall on a neighboring property that we got to worry about. They're going to put in some uh, water quality device in front of the wall. We're going to have piping underneath the wall. We're going to have a structure uh, behind that, and then two eight foot diameter pipes within 10 feet of the back of the wall. This wall is 15 feet high. The reinforcement length is probably going to be 10 feet or longer, uh, depending on soil conditions. We got a roadway up here. I'm going to suggest to them we need to move these pipes back. Uh, we want to get those out of the reinforced zone uh, so they're not causing any issues there. We also want to make sure what's going on with these pipes. Are they detention pipes or are they infiltration pipes? If they're detention pipes, they're going to store water. If they're infiltration, they're going to store water and then let it go back to groundwater uh, sometime later on. If we have a pipe in the backfill or any place back here that's going to allow water to leak out, we got to be concerned that what's going to happen with that water? Is it going to go towards the reinforced zone of the wall? Foundation. We want, if we have pipes going underneath the wall, we want to make sure we have adequate foundation that the contractor installing the storm sewer uh, puts a pipe in, compacts it properly, and compacts it all the way up to the bottom of the leveling pad. Either side of this pipe, as it goes under the wall, has a solid foundation. We want to mimic that when we put that pipe in there. Here's a couple of examples of a, a couple contact detention systems. This is a detention system here. You can see how large these structures are. And then here's an infiltration system uh, where this pipe is completely perforated. They'll store water and then allow that water to go back to groundwater. So if we had a retaining wall out front here, we have to be concerned with what's gonna go on there. If we have a concrete structure in and behind the retaining wall, we have a lot easier time of dealing with these type of structures. Concrete structure is going to be a structure by itself. It can stand there by itself. Uh, it can be designed to even support a little bit more load if necessary. So we can have our retaining wall. We have a limited space here, but our wall is tall enough that it needs longer reinforcements. Uh, we take some cable ties or rebar ties embedded into the concrete of the proper strength, take our four inch or three inch diameter pipe, thread it through those ties, and then we're going to wrap our geo grid around that pipe and bring it back to the front face of the wall. So in this example here, we have our geo grid below here. It's coming back, wrapping around the pipe and coming back to the front face of the wall, tying uh, the front face of the wall to this structure here. Typical example here is our reinforced structure, our con cast in place concrete structure, our grid going back to our tie and around that tie back into the front face of the retaining wall. Very typical application there. Anytime you have a concrete structure here, you can use the rigidness of that structure and the structural integrity of that to tie our wall facing to. Uh, you would want to discuss what the structural engineer is doing here uh, compared to what we're doing here and if that's going to affect the design of that structure. Uh, certain situations, we might get into a situation where we have a rock outcropping or something like that going on uh, behind there. We have so, uh, attached the soil nails, rock anchors, earth anchors, uh, so we can have a flexible facing here, use our same pipe uh, structure here and tie that back in here. This is typically going to be designed by somebody else other than the retaining wall designer. There are some wall designers that um, are good at these designs. Uh, but typically we're going to talk about what our loading is in this area so we can tie these two structures together. Get into barriers. Example, fencing, guide rail, structures behind the wall. All things we got to consider when we're looking at what's going on at the top of the wall. These are standard details that we follow. Anytime you have a, a vehicle barrier in behind the wall, we're going to have a three foot minimum from the front face of the wall to the front face of the structure or to the barrier. And it's going to be buried five foot deep minimum. And it's going to go through two layers of grid minimum. And these are just standard practices there. Uh, if we have to get this closer, we have to go to some something else that's more structural. 
to be able to handle those uh, vehicle loadings on here. Typical fence post application, uh, three foot minimum, two foot depth here. That's a very standard application. Uh, if we want to get closer, we're going to go to sauna tube type construction. And again, even in if we're doing a wood uh, post here, we're going to want to place a sauna tube here first. If this is a metal post, uh, like in the in the previous slide here, uh, metal posts can be driven through the geogrid zone. You can see they came in, put the asphalt in, drove the metal post in uh, after the fact, and then um, <clears throat> have no problem with that so if you're using sleeves go right ahead if we want to have the um, fence post closer to the back of the wall we're going to have a one and a half foot minimum three foot minimum embedment and it's going to go through two layers of geogrid here uh, if we have some type of concrete sidewalk or some type type of thickened edge here uh, for a sidewalk or a barrier we want to know what this size is and how it'll affect our top of wall and design our top of wall accordingly uh, to integrate that with that. Um, there is a product out on the market called Sleeve It. Uh, we see a lot of contractors like to use this. This is placed in behind the wall uh, during by the wall installer at the prescribed spacing for the fence post. Uh, this is designed to, to handle the, the loading and be placed uh, right in behind the retaining wall structure. You could see an application here. Wall was built. Fence post guy comes in. I'm going to drill my holes and look what we do. We tear up the geo grid. Something that we don't want to have happen. I've seen it where uh, we've come in and augured our fence posts in, tore the grid, and actually displaced the wall facing. So we want to place a sauna tube in here rather than augering through any of our grids. That way we're in control of what's going on. Planting details, uh, we have a lot of different, uh, we have a planting detail here. Uh, we wanna be aware of what size of the structure. We, we try to limit our max height of the, of the uh, planting to an eight foot max at a mature state. We wanna know what the root ball size is, see how it affects uh, the, the, layer, the top layer of grid, and we wanna see how it affects uh, the width uh, and how it's uh, impacting the back of the wall. Typically, we're going to see a two foot diameter plus uh, diameter one of the root ball structure as a spacing uh, back from the front face of the wall. So take a look at this. We have these details, uh, just a typical application with some plantings in behind the wall. Uh, with plantings, along comes irrigation. Let's put the irrigation lines in during the construction of the wall. Let's not come in and cut them in, cut the reinforcement. This is a multi-tiered structure. We've cut a layer of reinforcement here. This may affect the design of the retaining wall because this could this layer of reinforcement is probably running underneath this wall and extends back quite a bit, a bit of a distance. Anytime we put water in behind the wall, especially with irrigation systems, I tend to find that irrigation systems like to leak at some point in time and aren't properly maintained. So we got to watch that uh, and, and those type of things. I'm going to wrap things up here with our uh, just a few items that, that are available out there. We have our Keywall Pro software um, at keystonewalls.com slash software resources. Great program, help you design the wall. Uh, we can do it in section or in profile wall designs. The program doesn't design what I talked about today. It'll give you the loads that are in if the grids are 100% continuous, but it won't design structures in behind the wall. Uh, other things that we have available is the design manual for our Keywall Pro operating system. Uh, if you have our Keywall Pro software, and this might be the first time you heard, but we do have, we just came out with the Keywall Pro operating guide design manual that, that go, coincides with the program. Uh, that was recently updated in the last couple months. Uh, and we have construction manuals available for all our products. We have technical information sheets. Uh, we have specialty details. A lot of the details I talked about today are included here. And we do have uh, specific AutoCAD uh, details all available uh, from our website at Keystone Retaining at KeystoneWalls.com. Uh, check it out. Check out check out our technical resources there. Uh, we also have a YouTube page that I like to point people to. 
uh, Dan and I have been doing various um, little uh, tech tips that we place up on our web on our YouTube page uh, for people to take a look at. Uh, we also have a Keywall Pro webinar that's on there, and this uh, seminar will be placed on there after uh, uh, we edit that and uh, put it up on the website. Uh, any questions that you had? I know Dan's been uh, going through questions uh, through through the through the seminar here. Uh, I do want to point out if you need uh, if you want to apply for a continuing education credit, uh, send an email to Dan Tix at KeystoneWalls.com. Uh, put in the subject line webinar CEU credit. Uh, if you have questions, you can here's my contact information K Miller at KeystoneWalls.com or our general uh, phone number for Keystone Retaining Walls. Uh, this could get Dan or myself. Uh, also get our engineering department if we're not available. Uh, we do have a fully staffed engineering department with a staff of uh, four uh, engineers that are ready, willing, and able to answer any retaining wall questions that you have. Um, we also have our uh, field guys. We got Nick Fiorito out in New Jersey, Kurt Skinner, out in the Portland area, uh, John Schramm, who covers the the, the south um, east area, and Dan and myself are also available for for questions and answers and all that kind of stuff. I appreciate the time. Dan's got a few questions. I probably ran a little longer. Uh, if you know me, that typically happens. So I, I thank you for your time and and tuning in with us. Uh, Dan, take it away. Yep. Thank you, Keith. Uh, well done. Uh, appreciate the job you did there. Um, as always, if you do have more questions, I'm only going to be able to get to, we only have to, uh, a couple minutes here to get through a couple of questions left. I, bet I haven't quite published them yet. I was waiting to get to the end of the, the webinar here. Um, one question we have is, is uh, how to address if a contractor auger through the grid for a sign. Now, um, obviously your foundation, the size of the foundation by which you it, it was augered um, you know, if it's a small interruption in the grid and it was a one-time augering, that's not uh, necessarily going to be detrimental to the wall, okay? We're talking about major interruptions in the grid um, as tearing it in multiple spots, right? Um, the, the lucky thing about our wall or the, the enhanced options that we have with our walls is that they, you know, because the, the reinforcement is continuous, um, you can have these minor interruptions. It's not going to affect it, essentially the structural integrity of the wall. Um, we have another question. At what point do you allow plantings taller than eight feet? I assume the distance beyond the geogrid in the existing soil, but there's still height limitations due to the distance of the retaining wall. So what we've found is over the years with plantings, um, it, they can get, you know, it, it's, it's the size of the, the, the planting, it's the size of the root ball. Um, and by limiting it to an eight foot height, we can limit it to those uh, uh, minor interruptions in the grid that we talked about and have a specific spacing by which we can, um, you know, uh, dictate to the planting so that we're not interrupting the wall, right? A lot of the time uh, developers, engineers and things want to uh, break up uh, larger walls with tiered walls and they will put some plantings in to kind of uh, enhance the look of the walls. And so, um, but what we found is that we have two larger plantings. We have to put them kind of outside our reinforced zone. So try to limit those to a, a, an eight foot height. Um, let's see here. Uh, it says, how do you cut the geogrid? We have one last one. How do you cut geogrids around the sonotube? Well, installers are going to be placing the sleeves or sonotubes during wall construction. It's going to be the upper part of the wall. And so it's only going to be for the uh, um, typically the upper two courses of reinforcement. Now, we had the slit method. That's one way to do it that we showed in a pile obstruction. Um, that's one way where it's easily, you can just slit the grid. You're keeping the tensile members of the geogrid intact and you actually just bend them around the tube. That's one of the most common ones. Or you can actually kind of do a circular cutout for the sleeve. Um, anything over 12 inches generally gets to be uh, it where we prefer the slit method. So. Uh, that's about all we have time for today. Uh, thank you again for attending. You'll see here a reminder about the credit. Um, uh, just email me directly with the subject line webinar CEU credit, and we'll get those certificates out to you uh, as uh, we are able. And I uh, appreciate your time, and thank you for attending our webinar. 
Uh, look for a, an announcement in September regarding our next webinar topic, which will be low impact development with SRWs. Um, and hopefully uh, uh, we can see you all then. Thank you for attending.